um, go over it again, or in case Warren or Alicia want to go over it again, or go over what we did today. I don't really, it's very strange, but so um, let me do a screen share here to give you like a summary of the class and you can get an idea of where we've been, where we're going um, and where Kant fits into all of this. Um, and I'm glad, you know, I don't know, Ivy, have you thought of taking more RPH or of minoring in RPH or anything? I've taken um, a couple of philosophy classes in high school. I took several and I uh, thought about majoring in philosophy simply because a lot of the uh, beliefs or ideas that we go over in class are things that I already thought about before I picked up a philosophy book or had a class. So I find that, again, a little bit um, like, huh, it's kind of crazy to think we're not all connected if we're all coming to the same conclusion on our own you know, based on reasoning, um, so, but I don't know. Well, I'll tell you, um, I remember when I read Plato's dialogues and I thought, wow, I didn't know there was a discipline for this, right? Because he would ask, what is piety? And it's like, I used to think about that. And then what is beauty? Oh, I used to think about, and then what is justice? Like I used to, you know, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you realize actually that's what philosophy is. Okay, so I, I mean, that's why I ask. It just seems like you kind of naturally ask those questions. And I know that you can't get a job in it unless you want to be a preacher or something, but um, we have a minor that's just six classes. And a lot of students will major in something that they could get employment with, uh, but they minor and they, they like putting them together because, um, for example, both Alicia and Warren are psychology majors, I think. They're, and they like to supplement it with religion and philosophy because psychology teaches you a method, but it doesn't teach you what's worth thinking about, right? And so, for example, in psychology, you might have, um, the effect of religion on people's health, right? There have been studies about that. It depends upon how you think about God, but for a lot of people, if they think of God as forgiving and loving, they stay healthier, right? And um, uh, I, I t in my world philosophies class, you might wanna take that because it shows how the same virtues, Jesus, Socrates, Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, like you were saying, right? They all have a very similar foundation. And so in that class, you actually study specifically what's going on. Um, but in psychology, they might, I remember teaching this in logic, there was a correlation between people going to church regularly and staying healthier and being more self-controlled. But there were also some people whose religion made them sicker and more afraid and more depressed because they thought God was angry at them and that's why they were sick. So they were scared. And um, anyway, so in psychology, you would do a study on that, right? The effect of faith on health. But in philosophy, you study, well, how ought you to think about God? Or how do I think about God, right? So those really complement each other. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, so that's why I think it might work for you. I mean, I, I don't like selling my product. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a salesperson. But based on my experience, it just sounds like you naturally muse about it. You can actually get credit for that in college. And uh, you get to have classes with other students who naturally think about it. Um, and there's a lot of classes students take, not because they naturally think about it, but because you know of their career aspirations and the requirements and stuff. So you just take six classes I think at least three of them have to be upper level, but other than that, you, you just pick the topics you like. 
you know, women's studies, environmental ethics, business and professional ethics, religion in America. Um, there, you know, you get to have a free mind. You get to pick what you want to think about or what you've already thought some about, and you could do more research on it. And um, philosophical psychology, for example. Well, that's what we're taking now, right? Yeah. And so that's that you can understand how that would complement a psych. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then Warren feels that way, and Alicia is right toward the end of her college career and all the things everything is synthesizing together and we talk about her other classes and um just ideas are powerful and they when you compare them to each other and then you compare them to people's mindsets uh, i think it's important you know it explains a lot about what's going on politically in our country i think a lot of it has to do with how people think about god um because I, I was raised to think that um, God would want us to balance out the business sector with uh, institutions that try to redistribute wealth, that try to set up programs to promote flourishing for everyone, right? And that's what we call government, okay? So I was raised to think, yeah, they go together, but some policies are better than others, but you have to put a damper on greed. You can't just let greed control your society. Um, but of course, that's not the way a lot, of, a lot of people, students at Lyon were raised to think. So I was raised to think regulated capitalism is the best way for people to flourish, and that would be the union of reason and faith, and that would be what we would constantly think about in order to flourish. But God is not a Republican or a Democrat, right? God doesn't love capitalism or hate capitalism, and God doesn't love social programs or hate social programs, you know? <laughs> Our founders wanted to keep God out of this, right? Um, but anyway, so the way people think about God and the relation between reason and faith is so important for, mm -hmm. okay, as long, I really wish any student who really understands that should probably minor, you know what I mean? See, and I find it funny because I was raised in a really, um, it's a strict religious household, I want to say, simply because um my family they believe that you should go to church it's not like it was given you know a reason it was just done we just went to church um because there is a god and this is our service to him you know i feel like and in that that's how religion has became sickening um i feel like there's more and more people that don't understand the true notion of it they're just doing it because it's something that they're raised to do there aren't given reason and you were talking about how you were raised with capitalism and under this uh political household but i didn't really have uh politics in my life until late in high school like when i was about to graduate and even then it wasn't really in my life it was just something that i knew was there uh, and like when they everyone's like you gotta vote it's you know that's kind of like religion everyone's like you have to vote you have to do this but no one's really saying why you want it why why this president is better than this one they're just telling you to choose that one and it's up to you to go out and figure out which president is for you or which um party is for you same as with religion it's not up to your parents or someone to tell you hey you have to go to church or hey today at the day of you know it's not up to them it's you personally so I feel like they should instead of uh, what was it Warren his dad I feel like did a really good job because he told him there is religion it exists and this is what you can do and this is you know what I choose to do because this is what I figured out throughout my life works for me 
you're able to come up with your own ideas based off of that. And I feel like that allowed him to grow as a person rather than being an imitation of his dad and not really knowing what he's talking about. Like, uh, and for me, I tried to personally not let my parents um, cloud my judgment. That's just something that I've always had doubt about. Um, like when they tell you, you can't do that because God doesn't like it or um, your sins or your parents until a certain age, you know, when they tell you things like that, it's like, I'm a child. Sins? You know, <laughs> what do you read? Are, what I'm going to do is going to affect my life and determine whether I go to heaven. See, it's like that kind of information really played on my mind a lot as a child and uh, over my studies well not studies but experiences I started to think of religion as sort of um, the phone call game as I always say um, and it's basically it might have started off as one idea but everyone went off and twisted it and you know added their own moral values onto it so I feel like there is a central idea to take from and do what you will with it. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to read the Bible to be um, a good person or morally correct, as long as you listen to your reason, because the things that are in the Bible are based off of the reasons that we have already innately built into us, if that makes sense. Of course. So that's yeah. what I covered at the beginning, right? The virtues. Yeah. And so- yes. Yeah. Okay. So that made sense to you. That and Jesus and Socrates had that. Uh -huh. Okay. So it sounds like that registered. I don't know if you, if you remember that we did have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. And then also the idea of suffering, like some suffering is just the human condition, and some suffering is because of racism, and sexism, right? And greed. And that, again, is why I feel like you should um, not impose your thoughts or your uh, your beliefs onto your child, but allow them to make their own knowledge because you can grow up in life and be one of the people who don't find success in life because of what you're given beforehand. And you're not, you don't have the knowledge or the ability to know how to do better, if that makes sense, or where to look for, for help, um, even though it's like probably right there, you just don't know. Uh, and I feel like that, like, if say your parents wanted you to be a doctor and you go and you do, and you have great grades and you understand all of the things, but in the end, you're not happy being a doctor because that's not something you wanna do even though you probably are a great painter in your uh, spare time or you're really good at something else that brings you joy, you just didn't think it was a career. And I feel like it doesn't really matter what you do as far as a career because that's just money. That's just stuff for material things. And in the end, you can be homeless and poor and still be happy as long as you're content on the inside. Well, you know, you could turn to First Corinthians. Um where um paul says that let's see i can send you i had you know you know that quote different gifts the same spirit i have tried to read the bible so many times oh, but, fail. <laughs> i don't mind I, be, I don't mind i'm just trying to, to be politically correct because so many of the students read it you know mm -hmm. um so what i'll do is i'll send you to me, the cheat sheet for Christianity is uh, the, ser <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Matthew 4 to 6, and then it has all these virtues in it. And I also have this uh, attachment that has different gifts, same spirit. Now, I mean, that's because I was a preacher's kid, right? And obviously, I have a different gift, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I have to muse and i have to think things through and that didn't go over real well right um my parents were patient with me but you know other people didn't like me you know how most ministers everybody loves them and they're so nice and all that and anyway but that's why 
you know, it matters. And that's what you were saying, like different gifts, the same spirit. Okay. So we're born with these callings. So again, Aristotle's virtues say that some people are naturally good at leading and managing and making good laws, applying the laws, right? Other people are much better at, you know, the arts are perfectly respectable in Greek culture. They're important. They're part of education. So um, I think it's pretty much what you say. So we started out with that. And then another big theme in the class is how what sounds like a great theory can be applied in these different ways. So you remember the girls from Syria and Bangladesh were applying the Seneca's, the notion of the virtues, right? Yeah. And then there was those guys from the Reddit uh, that were applying it in these very misogynist ways. Remember, justifying sexual aggression, sexual. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's another major theme in the class. And um, then we had Augustine on reality. Remember that? That we have these innate ideas. Um, so it starts with math. And then you take this leap of faith. There must be a cause behind all this order, but you don't know what it is. And then he. He also says we have innate ideas of good and evil, innate ideas of justice and injustice. So those ideas were given directly by God, and we use those to evaluate stuff. Okay, so then, you know, I, I try to convince you, right? Every, every time I try to convince you, ah, oh, you should love this view, right? And then I give you an article about this girl for whom, uh, well, okay, Augustine had that doctrine of original sin, right? Um, the stealing the pears. Do you remember that? You, you spoke in class. Yeah. yeah, I did it because it was wrong. <coughs> so people are born believing, uh, wanting to do wrong because it's wrong. Now, Aristotle said kids are born morally neutral, and you should raise them to want to take pleasure in doing good. But Augustine says, no, that's impossible. You have to have grace. You have to have divine intervention in order to avoid sin. OK, so then uh, we talked about the problem of evil. Evil is the turning of the will uh, away from the eternal toward the temporal. And God didn't create it. God created free will. Free will is good. The universe is better because there's a creature with free will. But you, if it's free will, it has the potential to choose evil, right? But it, God didn't create the evil and doesn't want you to choose evil. So it's not God's fault. <laughs> All right. Question. So I don't know if we've talked about uh, sexuality in class or not, but I was just wondering, what... Would you say that sexuality is a free will or is it something that's out of your control? Well, he's down on it, right? Because it's the temporal, right? Sex okay. is to do with the temporal world. And he himself had sex with a prostitute and had a kid. And this is this is where this this woman talks about getting raised with this view that you're a sinner. Right, right from the time you're born. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And that was really hard on her. And people who are raised that way also have a lot of guilt about sexuality, usually, right? Yeah, and I, um, that's why I was kind of getting towards because I personally have, I've always known that I was attracted to either sex. And um, that's just something that. You know, I didn't really know that there was a difference or there was a, what, a normal C to it. I just knew that I found this person attractive, you know, not necessarily their gender. And so it kind of gives into if I don't really think about it, that there's something that my body feels is that bad. Will I be punished for something that's out of my control or is that? 
something that I should resist. Okay. You know, that's that sin. Right. Well, actually, if you unite reason and faith, then we have science saying that that's uh, let me i'll get to that in a minute because the pope <laughs> pope francis recently came out with a statement yeah. right so we talked about that yeah. yeah so all the mainline churches well actually the methodist church is having this war which is not faithful to the tradition of john wesley john wesley was educated at oxford so there are people who call themselves Methodists who aren't faithful to the tradition. And, you know, I find it annoying. But anyway, that's not your, unless you were raised Methodist and you know about the conflicts in the Methodist church. But, okay, so September 11th, there were a lot of different interpretations of God's interventions in history, right? Okay. And the trouble with trying to claim you know when God intervenes, is that it gets pretty sticky, right? Mm -hmm. So God punishes innocent people. God kills innocent children to test your faith, you know? And so there were preachers that said, yes, God is punishing us. And there were other preachers that said, that is outrageous, you know? God mm -hmm. doesn't kill people. So my point there is that once you split reason from faith, you can say anything and you know why don't you cut the middleman and just say you're making yourself into god if you mm -hmm. say, yeah okay so um i'm telling you ivy i think you would like you know taking more religion and philosophy right because you've always I've, always I've always just thought about the bible as being a book that someone they might have you know allowed their reasoning to speak through their writing, but they also, it's impossible to believe that they didn't, in fact, put their own beliefs onto their thought, you know, onto what it was saying. And then it's also been translated over years. So who knows what the translator wanted it to say? I mean, there's a slight difference between you can't, you can do this and you cannot do this. There's just that one word in there that they had to add or take out. That's it. And I feel like, um, and that you, again, have to go out and find out for yourself. Yeah, well, if you is. wanted to take Old Testament and or New Testament, Dr. Bubi, the way scholars study it, look, if there were at one absolute right and wrong, why did the people who put the Bible together have 150 books? And they're right. written by different <laughs> people and they don't even agree with each other. And there's two different creation stories. And they're, I mean, I took an Old Testament class, and there's the J author, the Y author, the Leviticus, the Deuteronomy. They all disagree. Then the guy who wrote Proverbs also wrote Ecclesiastes, and he had his midlife crisis and changed his mind. So, <laughs> so I mean, when my dad went to seminary, he, he, he said, you know, the people who put the book together wanted you to you told you indirectly you have to think about how you think about god so when i was in third grade my father told me well martha you're gonna have to figure out your own theology someday <laughs> and he's also my preacher right so i never had anybody telling me you know they knew what god thinks and so for me it's a very creative activity which is why i like just identifying students who naturally muse about it and just give them a chance because i have changed my mind many times since i was mm -hmm. in college but i'm always asking the question right and so um anyway um so then, so then yeah we did the proof so now we're, we're going into uh the catholic church so what um, St. Thomas did is he threw out those innate ideas of Augustine and he threw out starting with math. He brought in he brought in Aristotle. And so he united Aristotle with Christianity, right? And so that was uniting science with religion. And um, according to Aristotle, we are the creature in the universe 
who has this capacity to understand the universe because it can actually be understood. Um, there are all these patterns. That's why we've been so su su successful at adapting is because we can predict things because we understand patterns and we ask why, right? And we develop science, right? But I was raised to think God wants you to do that, right? If God didn't want you to think about stuff and help you help yourself and other people, why would God create a universe that's ordered? And why would God give you, you know, eventually evolve uh, you as a creature that understands it, right? And then, of course, evolution is the best way for the mind to develop because it's only because it's evolution that medicine actually works, right? Because your body is your body and it evolved. And that's why when you take this medicine, it will actually work because it's based on the way the body works. Whereas and it's crazy to uh, think about how much we've evolved, like as humans, like uh, we used to be really short, uh, menopause used to come before menstruation, like there's a lot about our bodies that has improved. And I find that miraculous that we were able to just figure out how to better ourselves, you know, just based on what we were given on this earth, and the knowledge that we have. Yeah, but I mean, it is it's miraculous, but not in a, you know, divine intervention, like God. Tells yeah, it's like we did, you know, it's, it's, um, how can I say, I, if, if the proofs for God is that there's two senses of God, one is God is the foundation of nature. And so God, in that sense, is every time we study nature, we're studying God, right? Right, there's no gap. And then when you add Christianity, you you have to believe Jesus was, you know, the incarnation of God and that God intervenes. But in the Catholic position and the mainline, God does not intervene in ways that undermine the natural order, right? And so, and so um, we, we continue to have science, right? So here's where Pope Francis came out being a lot more open about gay, gay stuff. So I, you would definitely want to read that, right? Yeah, um, I think I remembered um, they were talking about how, uh, what was it? Why would God judge or, you know, why would he judge you for that? <laughs> right. Yeah. And he also does think you should separate church and state. So even mm -hmm. if a priest does not want to have civil unions for gay people, I definitely he would not want them to have marriage, right? Because the purpose of marriage, the birth control thing, the purpose of marriage is the begetting and educating of children, right? Mm -hmm. So they were against artificial birth control. And um, uh, Alicia Warren and I spent a whole hour, you know, just talking about that. And you can, you can listen to that. And then mm -hmm. you could come to me and have some extra office hours if you want to talk about that. But that would mean, you know, there's no way that that Catholic priests are going to marry gay people, right? Um, the most liberal they would get would be civil unions. Mm -hmm. And a lot, there's been a lot of pushback among the priests and the cardinals. But Francis would definitely say that governments should allow for civil unions because, because there's a separation between the church's view of humanity and a government just trying to function. And when you ha have civil unions, you're, you're giving people the opportunity to make a commitment. You're also giving them responsibility to keep that commitment and you're giving them tax breaks, right? So you're reinforcing linking sexuality to long-term commitments. And that is good for a society because it maintains more stability in the society. Does that make sense, Ivy? Okay, so let's go to Pope Francis here and my main point here is that 
these ideas, the ideas we have, the worldviews that we, we have, um, make a lot of difference in what's going on in the world, right? Because right now, in many countries, religion is being used as a weapon to pit one group against another. And in India, in, well, really in the US too, right? Mm -hmm. um, after 9-11, Karl Rove, and this, he led the charge for creating a set a uh, rhetorical story about the US and the US founders, which is not accurate. But the goal of it was not to be accurate. The goal was to get Southerners to vote Republican. And that worked brilliantly. But part of that strategy was to say that our founders were conservative Christians, which they were not, and that they were patriots which they were not, they declared war on their <laughs> founders. I mean, really, I mean, they were not paid to plan. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, so um, there are a lot of politicians now that are using religion as a weapon to polarize. And so if you link reason and faith, like Francis, he says, no, right? That's wrong. Um, and that is really important. It's getting more important all the time. Uh, partisan bickering. This goes against um, the definition of a just ruler is somebody who uses their authority for the well-being of the ruled. And that's an Aristotelian view that the Catholic Church has adopted because it's natural. We need each other. God wants us. To, to use authority for the well-being of the rule. And so partisan bickering is against what God wants because you're not using your mind or you're using it in a corrupt way to give your party more power, but to polarize people and undermine the human well-being. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, stop punishing immigrants. Again, this goes back to we are all, we all have a common humanity, which is Greek humanism, and then St. Thomas, then Christianity. We're all made in the image of God, right? And the Old Testament has a lot of hospitality issues in it. Hospitality was a huge thing in, in ancient times because, you know, there were, you didn't just have money and go stay in a hotel. You had to, you know, the innkeeper had to accept you, mm -hmm. right? And it really mattered if they didn't, right? Or you would get caught on a road somewhere and there wouldn't be an inn. And it was very important. Hospitality was a huge virtue. And so he plays on that. Uh, foreign policy can't be guided by might makes right. Again, that's part of Aristotle's political virtues that we had in Seneca also. You remember we had personal virtues, social virtues. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, this is the, you know, use your power to gain more power for your friends and uh, family is wrong. It's, it's immoral and a rational point of view. And it's also against God's will. Um, stop the global arms trade, of course, that um, wars beget wars. The Greeks kept, had many, many stories about people taking revenge and everything just gets worse. So military solutions don't work. They create more problems than they solve. Uh, Homer's Iliad is about that. But anyway, and the Bible clearly is about that. The Catholic Church has very specific rules for what a legitimate war would be. And, you know, making money off of war is totally wrong, you know, both on the reason model and the faith model um, and the death penalty. People can actually convert at any point in time. So we have, it's wrong to kill people, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, 
it's just wrong. Yeah, and I find it, um, I find it funny that greed is, you know, deal, saw as this big injustice. Yet at this point, it kind of feels like it's the foundation of a lot of things. Um, for instance, war. I feel like one of the main reasons for war is greed, and for <laughs> um and for like keep for life now um i feel like the viewpoint of life is becoming more edged towards individual greed like individual wants rather than the good of society uh for instance you would think i need to spend my money uh life trying to figure out how to get money and which career gives me the most money so i can spend on stuff rather than thinking what is my duty or what is my goal in life um and again that just goes back to living a, a materialistic life and suffering right and then on abortion um okay the catholic church uh is against it and but pope francis doesn't obsess about that Pope Benedict is absolutely obsessed about don't use birth control and don't get an abortion. And so Francis uh, would never advocate it, but he would point out uh, a whole lot of complexities about it. For example, the politicians who claim to be totally against abortion, over and over, there are a number of Republicans that get revealed as actually having had affairs with married women, having affairs with an, a legislative aide and telling her to get an abortion. I mean, they're flaming hypocrites. And um, the truth is that they get power and money. They use the unborn to gain power and money, right? They, they you know, come across as that they really care about this issue. And then they get votes right which is what they mm -hmm. think about money and power but and they it doesn't change attention. i mean how many pregnant women died when we went into iraq and bombed the heck out of the place right oh that doesn't count right i and mean that's, the other thing is when you make birth control not accessible so planned parenthood does more to prevent abortions than any other organization because it gives teenagers sex ed and contraception. It's the only way to prevent abortion because when poor people, teenagers get pregnant and they know they can't afford this or it's gonna ruin their life or their dad is gonna kill them, they panic and they go get one, right? They go underground, they do whatever they have to do. I know and then there's uh, some states now where sex isn't the knowledge of sex isn't talked about like you see on tv where there's a certain age where your parents sit down and talk to you about the birds and the bees but i personally have never my parents never had that talk with me you know it was i you kind of just figure it out on your own once you get to that point in life and i feel like there's a lot of people who they're just out here having sex and they don't know that's where children come from you know that's you're not just supposed to do that because it feels nice children are the consequence of that and if you're not ready for it you're gonna have to deal with it and abortion is just thought as the easiest thing to do like you don't want to have a kid and then them not grow up and be in a good house you know not have good adoptive parents and then you don't want to have a kid and not be able to raise them yourselves and i just feel like abortion is put off as such a simple carefree thing because it's just mass it's not but, a life i mean the the problem is you can if you get one and nobody knows, you are rewarded, you stay in school, you get a good mm -hmm. job. The whole rest of your life, everybody thinks you're great. If you but you're not. One, if you don't get one, you suffer forever. Like nobody will help you, right? That's your problem. Mm -hmm. You're a single mom, like figure it out, right? But and I feel like what they don't talk about is um, I've seen or 
I've witnessed where people get abortions and they regret or like um there's been plenty of sh- yeah I say shows but there's been plenty of um things where people will get an abortion they don't tell anyone but they're not mentally healthy you well, know that sticks with them and so it's like they're like well I wonder if I wouldn't have gotten the abortion with that no. would I have been better or um they get the abortion and they're not able to have kids anymore that's another thing that they don't talk about abortion can be irre- like you can ruin your chances of having another child, period. Right. It's just that making it illegal does not change that. Yeah. Right? Making it illegal, you that that girl would have gone and get it anyway. Mm-hmm. Somewhere. She would have gone under Whether it be a coat hanger. Right. That's right. So it is regrettable. It's just that people will go, yeah, PTSD and all that. So we have to make it illegal. That's not the solution, yeah. right? The solution is sex ed, contraception, you know, the solution actually in the other. You're the other trying thing, to prevent the, the issue. Abstinence only education does not work, right? Yeah. So the states that have where parents don't teach sex ed, they don't talk about it, they don't have contraception. Those are the ones that with the highest rates of teen pregnancy. And um, either those girls panic and go get abortions or they have these babies and they live in poverty. And, you know, the state has all these kids on its hands that have no future. So, you know, from a public policy standpoint, if you want to minimize the number of abortions, you have to keep it legal. And then you have to do all these things that have been evidence driven to minimize the number of abortions. And so I think Pope Francis is aware of all that nuance. And so he doesn't obsess about this, which is doesn't mean he, he just is a lot more worried about, you know, the bigger issues. Mm-hmm. Like if you think war is bad, there's a lot of pregnant women who lose their babies or die. I mean, if you're just talking, and in the in Africa, there are women. I had a student who saw this. They they couldn't get abortions. They couldn't use birth control. They ended up having to cannibalize their baby to feed it to their other children, or they all would have starved. Right? I mean, that's uh. and so the priest who lived in that village he advocated abortions you know because he knew the choice it's not like these women get pregnant so they can cannibalize their babies Mm -hmm. it's they have no other choice that's and that's why those rich powerful senators in washington really annoy me right they don't even try to think about what this means to people other than themselves right And they don't think about that Planned Parenthood does more to prevent abortions and they do more to cause more abortions. It's very annoying. But anyway, that's a public policy issue, right? And and I find it, uh, I always say I find it funny, (laughs) but I realized that when when I was younger, there was this whole uh, knowledge that, you know, child teen pregnancy can be dangerous it can be risky you know it's sometimes you are the child and everyone from the previous you know our parents were they had children at a young age and they were trying to get us not to have children at a young age but now there's babies having babies everywhere and it's crazy and I feel like um that is again one of the fuel factors for abortion because they're still children themselves they don't know how to they don't know what they're going to do so it's kind of that fear of what am I going to do that's a good question too because (laughs) there isn't a long-range plan you know having a kid is a 20 plus year project Um, yeah they don't talk about you know the consequences of sex so they just end up with the kid (laughs) oof It happens all over the world too. Um, So then again, with uniting reason and faith, you would say that, you know, people say, well, God wants abortion to be illegal 
But the answer to that is no, God wants us to minimize the number of abortions, right? And of course, God doesn't want us to have sex out of wedlock, but you know what? Yeah, I feel like that's God why. Wants, God wants us to minimize the number of abortions. So you can be perfectly Christian and think abortion should stay legal, but be combined with sex ed and um and contraception but the other issue oh she's out oops Because, because if you wait until marriage, the chances of you having 20, 30, you know, a lot of kids are very limited. And especially since most people, they wait until they're older to get married. And uh, again, in that time frame from where you're, what, 20, 30 to menopause is not that long. So you're not going to well, have that many. Actually, years. Ivy, what? what i said in class was i i spoke like the pope you know and i oh. gave a very compelling argument that sex should be tied to reproduction and both alicia and warren sort of agreed with me and then i said yeah but look at our society everybody's healthy there's all this sexually charged advertisement but you tell your kid well, well, you have to go to college, go to grad school, get established in a job. So don't have sex until you're 28 and then everything will be fine, right? And then, and then they both understood, are you gonna be able to look your kid in the eye and say that, right? Do you see what I mean, Ivy? Our society as a whole is, is not natural. We're not functioning on nature's cycles, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's where we're at. That's why Francis doesn't emphasize don't use birth control because he knows the consequences are, first of all, he's, he's worried about climate change, right? And if you have all these, we have too many people. Um, and so he focuses on that. He focuses on people getting decent jobs, on employers paying decent wages and Okay, again, if you have too many people, that's going to be more and more of a problem. Um, and politicians and business people can be unjust because they have so much power because people are so desperate. So um, let's see. So the, these are all the union of reason and faith, right? Does that make sense, Ivy? Uh -huh. And so th those are positions that a lot of Protestant churches agree with also. And then Martin Luther King's letter, did you read that? Uh, yes. Okay. Um. Well, if you have to go, um, we can meet again. I just want you to feel like you're understanding the flow of the class. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> this is where I wrote a long outline. I compared them to the prophets um because you can definitely link this with judeo-christian tradition it's just that you definitely pick and choose it's just that everybody picks and chooses <laughs> and so you have to sort of admit that he refers to augustine he refers to uh, aquinas natural law he has this trouble with organized religion which is exactly what you were talking about right um, he was a radical conservative and since equality is equality, you know, our founders are a bunch of hypocrites. We're going to make good on this. Um, our founders were heretics and traitors, right? And um, he was labeled a liberal extremist, even though he was conservative. He thought we have a natural capacity to recognize truth, right? Just like the Racism is a lie about our physical, our genetics, 
and you can't base a society on a lie. Um, liberal arts, our capacity for cultivating. Uh, so he talks about Socrates, he united reason and faith, and he want you live the truth. Okay, so that was the main point there is that he's continuing this tradition. Um, and then we get into the modern world. So then we have Newtonian physics. So this is what I'm going for is that Descartes and Kant are called rationalists, but it's a modern view of reason. It's not wisdom. And Descartes, if you go and listen to the recording, what the punchline is that people today who think like Descartes are engineers, right? They detach and they do math and they impose that onto the world the way Descartes did. So Bill Gates is it trying to re-engineer nature because carbon, he's really freaked out about carbon because uh, of the facts. But then the Koch brothers also are fossil fuel billionaires and they're pushing back and they, they are the worst offenders for destroying our environment, putting carbon in the air. They are also engineers. Uh, Charles Koch has a bachelor's degree from MIT. And so engineering, this mentality has a big impact on the world today. You have two different sets of people with this mindset. Um, and, and, you know, you can, and they also think about God in entirely different ways, right? Because you just go from math to God. Well, I mean, Bill Gates would say, if there's a God, I'm sure God would want me not to let nature be destroyed. And the car, you know, and the Koch brothers would say they just, I don't know, they identify conservative, they don't care, they don't think it's going to happen. They're just obsessed about greed, to tell you the truth. Um, I don't know how they think God can think it's okay for us to destroy the creation, but there must be a lot of people who do think that based on the book of Revelation the end times or something. Um, does that make sense, Ivy? Yeah. Then when he talks about clear and distinct ideas, you only act on clear and distinct ideas, which is like, you would never get married, you never have kids. I mean, most of our decisions are imprecise. They're not clear and distinct, right? And so we can, go, we can talk a little more, more about that next time. And then next time we're, we'll have to just do Kant. We, I thought, you know, I figured we, we would have this class right now for you to sort of get, get, get in the game. Yeah. And now that, that nobody's here, we might as well all three do it on Wednesday. Is that okay, Ivy? Yeah. And um, then on Wednesday, we'll do this one. And on Friday, we'll do that one. So we always just have two days of material and three days to do it. So that's okay. working out. Okay. And if you have any other questions, um, you can let me know when you'd like an office hour if you're feeling uh -huh. lost or anything. But I'm glad, you know, that you naturally think about it because then you're not so lost. You uh -huh. can get it. Okay? Yeah, it kind of clicks. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Well, okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.